Cause you have changed my life And I am new Because you died for me I'll live for you Because you died for me I'll live for you All I want is you Cause you have changed my life And I am new Because you died for me I'll live for you Because you died for me I'll live for you How can this be That you were condemned That you took my place So that I could live
Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, He washed it white as snow. Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, He washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. God, you truly are the King of glory. 
Lord, we recognize your Lordship. God, we recognize your majesty. Lord, we honor you and we honor your presence. When the King of Kings enters the room, what can we do but bow and kneel before you? Lord, giving you our lives, giving you our worship. God, humbling ourselves, Lord, even in your presence as we recognize, Lord, that you are here in our midst. Lord, we open our hearts to you today. Lord, we open our lives to you today. God, we come and we draw near by faith, just like Hebrews says, to come boldly into your presence by the blood of Jesus, because of what you've done for us, cleansing us, saving us, forgiving us. Lord, it's the only appropriate response is, is to worship you, Lord, in light of what you've done for us, in light of your great mercy. God, so we do sing hallelujah. We do sing here comes the king. We do sing blessing and glory and honor and power. Lord, to you alone, Lord, to you alone, who all the praise and all the glory belongs. Oh God, we honor you, Lord. God, we thank you for this time in your presence. Thank you, Lord, that we're transformed when we, when we behold you, God, when we look upon you. Second Corinthians says, those who behold him are transformed from glory to glory. Lord, thank you for the work that you're doing in our lives. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness to us. Thank you for your goodness. God, we honor you, we love you, and we thank you today. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Hey everybody, my name is Pastor Isaac, and I wanna thank you for being part of Sound Offerty Church today. We are continuing with the second part of our series, God is Good and God Does Good. So grab your Bible and grab something to take notes with, and we're gonna get started. Welcome Soundophony Church. I am so excited to be with you again to share with you the second part of our message on God is good and does only what is good. Now, last time we talked about this concept and actually really a belief system that God is good and does what is good. We looked at several verses in Genesis where God saw what he made and describes it as good. And at the end of all creation, he says it's very good. Uh, Psalms 119 verse 68, you are good and what you do is good. Teach me your decrees. And uh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. First Chronicles 16 verse 34. We get this idea in scripture that we serve a God that is good and only does what is good. Now, by the way, the God of the scripture is the true God. And sometimes we can make up gods in our mind that aren't the true God. So I encourage you, know uh, the God of the scripture and how you get to know him is by reading about him and spending time with him. Read your Bible, pray, and he will continue to reveal himself to you. That's a promise made in uh, Romans, actually Romans chapter one. So last time we also touched on the character of Joseph from the Old Testament. Now I won't spend all the time retelling his story. It's a fabulous story. I very much summarized it. I encourage you to read it. If you haven't, please go back and read it. It's so fantastic. It'll build your faith. It will encourage you. And he is a shining example of someone who held fast to their belief that God is good and does what is good. And because he believed that way, his whole life and the trajectory of it was truly marked for the plans and the purposes of God, so much so that when he reveals himself to his uh, brothers that were horrible to him, in Genesis 45, he says, don't be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, but God sent me before you to preserve life. Now, therefore, it was not you who sent me here, verse eight, but God. He had the faith to see beyond his external circumstance to allow God to work good inside of him. And this week, what we're going to talk about is kind of the second part question that always comes with this idea is, is God good? And if God is good, why is there bad and evil and suffering in the world? Valid question. 
I'm not going to make light of it. And my explanation today is not by any means exhaustive, but I do think it is thorough, or I should say complete. And uh, let's start with a bigger picture. Where does evil, bad, and suffering come from? Where does evil, bad, and suffering come from? If God is good and only does what is good, what is this other thing that we're experiencing in the world? And uh, the first part to the answer is sin, the result of sin. Evil, bad, and suffering comes because there is sin in the world. Everything is broken. If you go back to Genesis and we read several scriptures in the beginning where it describes the creation account, how God created the earth, created the world as we know it, and it's all good. Everything in creation is good. Well, then we see a man and woman placed in the garden and they're given a job to do and they're also given a boundary. And he says, you may eat of any tree of the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So you can eat of the tree of life all day, every day. I actually encourage you to, but just don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Do you think God didn't want his kids to know the difference between good and evil? Of course not. He wanted to be the one to teach them and define good and evil for them. God wants you to know the difference between good and evil, but not through experience, through knowledge and wisdom rather than you doing evil and experiencing the pain from it. So anyways, that's uh, that's a whole other sermon for another day. But man and and woman together decide, meh, we're going to do things our own way. And they rebel against God, take the fruit, disobey. And guess what? They broke everything good. Their eyes were opened. They were naked and ashamed. All of a sudden they had shame. They had fear. They had the result of sin in the world. Because of that, sin breaks everything. It ruins absolutely everything. And then that puts sin in hearts, the human heart. Uh, The Bible describes Adam, the first Adam, as the first Adam. And it says we are all of Adam. What that means is we are all descendants of Adam, obviously Adam and Eve, but we all are born with this sin nature. We naturally sin without anyone teaching us to do it because that is now a part of our nature. It's not how God originally designed us, but humankind with their free will and selfishness screwed it up and we're born with this sin nature. We are broken. We're bust broke. We can't help but sin and sin hurts everyone and everything. We desperately need a savior. And so that's why there's always talk in the Old Testament of a promise of a savior to come. And we see that savior in Jesus Christ at the beginning of the New Testament. Thank God for his incredible mercy for sending us a savior. But before all that, sin comes into the world and it breaks um, us, breaks everything, and then sin is in our hearts. The human heart is broken. It's bent on sinning. Because of that, sin comes because of our bad decisions. We're sinful people, so we make bad decisions that create pain and suffering for ourselves and other people. And it's in the world. Sin and suffering, um, evil, has been introduced In the garden, it was introduced by the serpent and the serpent enticed them or tempted them and they took the temptation and took the bait and decided to disobey. Sin then became a part of the human heart and everyone is born naturally sinful. And so because of that, that creates sin in the world, suffering, pain. If God is good, then why does he allow wickedness, and evil to exist. This is what we kind of just talked about. Humanity chose to separate itself from God through disobedience. You see, God honors and places such a high value on free will. He honors that choice and allows the results of the disobedience, which is wickedness and evil, to exist in order to demonstrate to us the consequences of turning away from him. He's kind of like, look, I'm going to let the bad fruit of selfishness and disobedience play out so that at the end of human history, I can judge it, hang a sign over it that says sin doesn't pay and lock it away for eternity. There's a fantastic 
book in the back of your Bible called Revelation. It's it, There's a lot in there. I don't recommend jumping in there first if you've never read the Bible. Start with Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. But um, in there, there's this beautiful promise, even near the end of the book, that says, and the curse will be no more. The curse referring to the curse of sin. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, they broke God's uh, covenant and sin entered the human heart and it was a curse upon mankind. The curse someday will be no more. And we have a promise from Jesus himself. But Jesus comes and he gives us a new life and a new heart. We no longer are enslaved to sin. We don't have to sin when Christ is our master. We choose. And when he is our master, we choose righteousness. He's not a harsh slave driver. He's a loving master that wants actually relationship, so much so that he adopts us into his family. And so this time in between where we're living in the time where evil is still roaming, there's the redeemed people of God who are choosing not to sin and actually overcoming evil with good. And then there's the promise of the future where God redeems his people. He creates new heavens and a new earth and the curse is no more. So someday far in, in the future, that will be, but for now, sin is a part of our world. Therefore, wickedness and evil is a part of our world. But if God is good, then why does he allow bad things to happen to me? That's like the rubber meets the road, right? That's what everyone wants to know. They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But what about me? Where is God when I hurt? Where is God in my pain? Does God care about my pain? Does he do that to me? Well, no. Remember, God is good and he only does what is good. But why does he allow bad things to happen to me? Well, I think God allows negative things to happen for several reasons, and I get these reasons from a scripture. Uh, the first one we kind of talked about, the first reason is so that we can see the ugliness of sin and disobedience. You see, sin and disobedience actually have a really hefty price tag. The world and media and movies and social media want to just like airbrush it, like, oh, it's not that bad. Sin's not that bad. It's actually kind of cute. It's fun. It's 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 um it's enticing it's it's exciting it that is like the farthest thing from the truth it's not it's none of those things it's terrible and the fruit of it is awful and it's long lasting but the devil's a liar and a deceiver and so he wants to deceive people to think it's not that bad romans chapter 2 verse 11 um says says this i'm sorry Romans chapter 2, verses 8 through 11 say this, But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. What's this Jew and Gentile talk? We'll talk about that when we get to Romans. But he's basically talking about God's not picky, if you're a Jew or you're not a Jew, it doesn't matter. Same rules apply. That's basically what that means. Verse 10, but glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. He's not talking about empty good works. Like, oh, if you just do like good things, it'll work out well for you. We're talking about a righteousness that comes from believing in Christ. When you put your faith in Christ, his righteousness becomes yours. And then from that righteousness, you do good works. But verse eight, for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there'll be wrath and anger. There is ugliness to sin and disobedience. If God were to never let us see the pain and the evil that comes from our selfishness and our disobedience, we go right on doing it because we think there's no, there's no consequence for it. And that's just not the truth. He's a loving father. So he allows us to see the consequence of our actions to teach us to better. The second reason I think God allows uh, bad things to happen to you and I is that seeing the experience of this ugliness and sin helps motivate us to forsake sin. You see, we wouldn't leave sin if we didn't see how bad it really was. Now, again, I know, I know, I live in the same world you do. 
that sometimes it looks awesome and uh, it doesn't really, it seems like the bad guys get away with it. That's just not true. And there is a penalty to sin. The wages of sin is death is what Romans tells us. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Acts three nineteen says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. God is a God of hope. He's a God of forgiveness. And seeing how bad sin is should cause us to turn and motivate us to forsake sin. You know, in workout world, they have like Motivation Monday, where you look at pictures of like, I don't know, what you used to look like or what you want to look like to get to keep you motivated. I don't know what end of the spectrum you fall on, but motivation is a powerful thing, but there's a right kind of motivation and a wrong kind of motivation. Uh, if your motivation is just selfish, like, oh, I don't want to do that again because it didn't feel nice to me. That's a that's actually kind of a shallow motivation that won't last that long because you will have a higher pain tolerance than you think. But when you see how sin hurts other people, or maybe people you love, or maybe innocent people, man, that can motivate you much, much deeper. And then it goes even deeper when you think about the honor and the glory of God. How does my actions reflect on God, on his honor, on his name, on his glory? If I'm called a Christian or a Christ one, how I act reflects heavily upon the God that I serve. And that should mean something to us. I think it does. And so that motivates us to forsake sin. A third reason I think why God allows bad things to happen to us sometimes is these difficulties mature us and help us grow in Christ. I want to read to you again from Romans chapter 5. I'm going to read verse 1, but the the real part that I want you to hear is in verse 3 through 4, but I want to read you the context. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character and character hope. Whoa. If that's not a life first, I don't know what is. I already have my life first, but this could be a second one. Not only this, but we boast in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character and character hope. It's this beautiful progression that Paul is writing here that our sufferings can produce perseverance. Perseverance, hupomone, this enduring um, quality that then produces character, character. We produce the character or the, or the image of Christ, and that produces hope. We're not suffering pointlessly. We're not enduring hardship needlessly. It's producing something good deep inside of us that's internally good. It's producing the image of the sun where people look at us and they see it, an image of, of Christ. Think about a, a quarter. There's an image imprinted on the quarter. It's a profile of George Washington. It's, it's an image and we look at it and we see the likeness of someone else. When people look at your life and my life, they should see in, in our character, the image of the son, Jesus Christ, the son, S-O-N. And that son, the image of him should produce hope. There is hope that God can change me. There is hope that I don't have to stay broken. There is hope that I can have a new life in Christ. There is hope that God can change who I am to be like Jesus Christ and that I can live a life that is pleasing to him, that glorifies him, that I enjoy and I will enjoy him forever. That is is good. That produces good. James chapter one, verse two through four. My kids are memorizing this right now. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith produces, there's that word again, perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. 
the whole point of, of James' letter to the church is that you would be teleos. It's this Greek word that means complete, whole, integrated, that your faith and your life would be rolled into one. You're not chopped up into this, I'm this person on Sunday, I have this religious box, and then I'm this way on Saturday night, and then totally this way on Friday, and then like Monday through Thursday, I'm like this. No, no, no. You're one whole complete person producing the image of the sun. Perseverance will finish its work that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Friends, we can look at difficulty and challenge and suffering and embrace it because we know it can produce good deep inside of us. And that good doesn't just stay inside of us. It turns into hope for the world that needs hope and not hope in like we're together in this. No, hope that's in Christ Jesus that will redeem the world and will bring good out of all of this. Lastly, I'm preaching now. Lastly, I believe that God allows good in these bad things to happen to you and I because these difficulties demonstrate how dependent we are upon God. Psalm 34, verse 22. Psalm 34, 22. The Lord will rescue his servants. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. I love that. We can take hope that these difficulties demonstrate we are dependent upon God. Being dependent upon God is a beautiful, wonderful, mature thing. Independence from God, woof, you're in you're in no man's land. You're like a free for all. But when you're completely dependent upon God, you are the safest you could ever possibly be. Only what God allows will come to me. He does allow difficulty to come my way in order to grow me and mature me. I want you to look at Romans 8. If you have your Bibles, take a moment, flip over to Romans 8, because I want you to see this verse in your Bible, and I want you to, if you if you feel comfortable, underline it, highlight it. I got these gel highlighters. They're my fave. I recommend them to everyone, because they don't bleed through the page. Romans 8, and I want you... Uh, to read actually let's start in verse 26 in the same way the spirit also helps our weaknesses for we do not know how to pray as we should but the spirit himself the holy spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words and he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of god verse 28 And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. I love that. The NIV says, and we know that all things God works for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. Notice that it says in all things, both in the good, the bad, and the ugly things, God is working for your purpose good. God uses all of them to work good in our life. The good, the bad, the things we don't like, the things that are painful. He uses it all to work internal, eternal good for us. And that, my friends, is truly good. Now, remember this working of good in our lives, no matter what the circumstances, can take place, but it requires our cooperation. It's always God's intention that good come from every circumstance. Not that good is every circumstance. We're not saying every circumstance is good. I'm not saying that. But I am saying it's always God's intention that good comes from every circumstance. But it requires our cooperation. Okay, Katrina, how do I cooperate? I want this. I want to. I, 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 I see that it can be good for me, kind of like working out at the gym. I got to have resistance if I really want to grow my muscles. I, I really have to, you know, have some sort of something pushing back against it. So I get that. But how do I do that? How do I cooperate with him? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. The way we cooperate with him is we believe. We believe that he is good and he does good. Therefore, we don't blame him. We don't judge him. 
we don't sit in a place that says, why would you allow this to happen? As if we know what the outcome is for everything. But in faith, we surrender and believe that everything that comes to us is allowed by God and his intention is for our good. And I want to add to that, not just our good, but for the good of those around us from those verses we read in Romans and James, that it produces in us a character and a hope, and the hope for not just us, but for other people. So when circumstances come, good, bad, and ugly, they can be for your good. Why? Because we serve a God who is good and does what is good, and he can work that internal, eternal good inside of us as long as we cooperate with him. And we cooperate through belief. We believe he's good and he does good. We trust him because he's good and he does good. And we surrender to him. Lord, whatever you want from me, you can have it. That's kind of the definition of a Lord. He's the boss. That's what I tell my kids. He makes the rules. What he says goes. It's not a democracy. He's the Lord of my life. And he's a good Lord. He is good and he does good. Church, I love you. Let me pray for you real quick. Father, we just thank you so much that your word reveals your character to us. Your character is good. Your nature is loving. You are compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loyal love, and you're trustworthy. You're true. So, Lord, we put ourselves in the position of trust and dependence upon you today. We surrender our hearts afresh to you, saying, Lord, we cooperate with you and your will. And because you are good and you only do good, Lord, would you work this good inside of me? I surrender these circumstances to you. God, I ask that you move in my life so that the way that I respond would be like Joseph in the Old Testament, where I can live my life in a place fully dependent on a good God working something good from my life. Lord, we thank you for your loving nature. We thank you that we can throw ourselves upon your mercy. We thank you that you hear our prayers. We thank you that your word guides us and that your spirit leads us. So Lord, we commit ourselves afresh to you today. We ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. And all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful Oh my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after, it's running after me Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. My life laid down, I surrender now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness of God